when, when I was on your show, you know, last time, you know, gold was still around 2000 and it's pulled back recently, but it's still above 2600. Gold is on pace to have its biggest gain since 1971, 1979 rather. And it's not a coincidence that gold is moving this much, especially when the Fed is starting to cut rates. I mean, we're just beginning this new easing cycle. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X, and of course your host for this channel. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation that we have lined up for you today, because it's with Peter Schiff. He's the Chief Strategist, Global Economist over at Europe Pacific Asset Management, and we've had Peter on the channel a couple of times in the past. Last time was eight months ago, and uh, it has been a tumultuous le a year, and uh, we've just seen a Fed rate cut, China stimulus, and lots of lots of other macro news and i'm really looking forward to peter's prediction and sort of peter's forecast and to peter's estimate of the economy in general where are we at right now gold is gold is rallying the u.s dollar is is looking sluggish i have to admit although it's it's, it's showing some signs of strength here in the last few days but overall it's been sluggish the chart has been trending down so i'm really curious uh if it all fits uh, still fits peter's narrative of a u.s dollar collapse gold price rally and uh, rising bond yields of course as well really looking forward to catching up with him before i switch over to my guest Hit that like and subscribe button. I know 80% of you watching are not subscribed to our channel. Kindly change that. It helps us out tremendously, and we tremendously appreciate it. So thanks so much for that. Now, without much further ado, Peter, it is great to welcome you back on the program. Thanks so much for making the time again. Oh, hey, Kai. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, and absolutely. It's already been eight months. It's time crazy. Flies. Time flies. It's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, it has been a busy year because it feels like every day we're getting hit with some macro news and uh, some macro shocks to uh, to our overall, overall thesis here. And I'm really looking forward to catching up, hearing your thoughts. Like, uh, maybe we'll start at the top. H how strong is the U.S. economy right now? And uh, what has changed since we last spoke? Has it weakened? Has it, strength has it gained strength? Where are we at, Peter? I, I don't think it's strong at all. I think the talk of a strong economy is a myth. I think the economy is very weak and it, it's getting weaker. It doesn't matter uh, about the numbers. You know, the, the most recent report we got was the non-farm payroll report last week that beat estimates. Um, but these numbers are extremely unreliable. Uh, they're often revised generally downward. And if you look at the household survey, I, I think all the jobs were government jobs. Uh, the private sector lost jobs. Uh, and especially if you don't do the seasonal adjustments, I think it was about 500,000 jobs that were lost. So uh, when they adjusted it, it was a creation of 100 and some odd thousand. But the, the government sector jobs, I think, were the most ever, the biggest uh, month for government employment uh, ever when you don't adjust it. And I think on the adjusted basis, there was only one month uh, during uh, COVID uh, where there was more government hiring. So government jobs are not a sign of a strong economy. In fact, they weaken an economy because we have to pay for those jobs. They're non-productive jobs. Uh, they result in bigger deficits, higher inflation. Uh, that's really all we have is we have, you know, inflation that, that masquerades as, as growth. And we got a bunch of phony numbers. But I think the economy is very weak. That's why the Fed is cutting rates and they're going to cut them even more. And I think they're going to go back to QE because long-term interest rates started to rise the minute the Fed cut short-term rates. And now, as you mentioned, we're back above 4% on the 10-year. And if the Fed doesn't go back to QE, we'll be at 5%. And then if it doesn't go back to QE, we'll be at 6%. And these higher rates are going to weigh heavily on an overly indebted U.S. economy. 100%. And I think lots to follow up on because we need to talk about some of the effects the Fed is or some of the actions the Fed has taken, um, whether that's a, a form of QE in itself, right? Dude, would you would you consider that maybe we start there? Like Fed lowering interest rates? Is that a form of QE? I've read that thesis a couple times. Curious what your thoughts? Well, are. that's not it's not QE yet in, until they start expanding the balance sheet, which I think is coming because without that, long term rates are going to go up, even though the Fed is lowering short term rates. And they need long-term rates to come down. And, and so when they rise, that's when you know they're going to go back to quantitative easing. And I think they're going to start uh, you know, probably by Q1 of next year. I mean, they could even do it this quarter, but 
uh, they may be able to hold off until uh, next year. But if they want to stop rates from rising, that's what they're going to do. Now, it's not going to work long term. Rates are going to go up even faster because QE is just inflation. And the more inflation they create, the more upward pressure they put on, on long term interest rates. The relationship of long-term interest rates with uh, what the Fed is doing and the Fed funds rate um, is a curious one I've been trying to explore with a couple of guests on the program here in the past. Um, you you su- su- predicted 10% in our last conversation like eight months ago that bond yields will go or trend towards 10%. Like, What kind of pressure will that put on the Fed in terms of the interest rates? Like, wh- what they well, should, what, what should they be doing? It's going to put tremendous pressure long before we get to 10%. The Fed is yeah. going to be creating a lot of inflation. They're going to be buying a lot of debt which is one of the reasons that you know, the rates are ultimately going to go that high, if not quite a bit higher. Um, you know, they went higher than that in 1980, and we were in much better fiscal shape then than we are now. And we have a much bigger inflation problem now than we had in the 1970s. And you know, we mentioned gold. You know, when, when I was on your show you know, last time, you know, gold was still around 2,000, and it's pulled back recently, but it's still above 2,600. Gold is on pace to have its biggest gain since 1971, 1979, rather. And it's not a coincidence that gold is moving this much, especially when the the Fed is starting to cut rates. I mean, we're just beginning this new easing cycle. Uh, In in, uh, 1979, you know, the Fed was still tightening. In fact, in 1980, that's when the Fed got rates to 20 percent. That's what really stopped the gold bull market. But this gold bull market is just getting started because the Fed is in anywhere near hiking rates. In fact, they're they're cutting rates. Absolutely. Like, how, how much more cutting do you do you predict? Like, is it going to trend to zero? Like, I know I that's probably everybody's be able guess, to but pull off zero again. I mean, we'll see. Uh, but there's a lot of inflation now that's going to you know really become a big problem next year, um, and so I don't know that they'll be able to get away with being that aggressive on the rate cuts, but they will be doing a a pretty big uh, quantitative easing. How how do you weigh political pressure? Because the US debt situation, 35 trillion, a lot of refinancing needs to happen next year. How is that weighing on uh, interest rate decisions? And apparently it's not, but uh, we we, we all know, right? (laughs) That's one of the main reasons the Fed is cutting is to try to make it easier for the government to finance maturing debt or refinance maturing debt and also the new debt. Remember, we're adding two, three, four trillion a year to the national debt right now. So all that has to be financed. But then we have to uh, roll over all the maturing debt, which is a much bigger number every year. But, you know, we have to make sure that the bondholders, you know, re-up that when the bonds mature, they don't ask for their money back because we don't have it. (laughs) So we have to convince them to keep loaning it to us. And it's going to take higher and higher interest rates uh, to get them to agree. I was going to say the market is not taking the bite based on the just the development of the 10 year, for example, that's was close to 3.75. Now we're over four again, trending higher. The, the mar- what does the Fed have to do? What does the U.S. Finance Department have to do to keep bonds attractive? Well, they're, I mean, they're no, nowhere near attractive. I, I don't <laughs> understand, you know, the markets and their you know, their, their confidence in the Fed. In fact, if you go back and look at the break-even spreads between treasuries and tips, and you go back and look where they were at the beginning of 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, bond investors keep expecting inflation to be close to 2%. Even though, you know, we've had 5%, 7%, you know, 4%, their actual inflation rate has been well above what investors have expected in, in, in the bond market. And, and that's the case now. I mean, every year, no matter how bad inflation is the prior year, the bond market is just assuming that it's going to be 2%, you know, for the rest of the you know, 30 years. And, you know, so at some point, the bond market is going to have to come to terms with reality that, you know, this, this 2% target is all fantasy land, that the Fed isn't going to even come close to achieving that. It, it's all the pretense. Uh, smoke screen, inflation will be much closer to 10% than 2%. In fact, it could be above 10%. (laughs) Um, But there's no way it's going to average anywhere near 2%. So the the, the bond market is completely wrong. And at some point, uh, that's going to have to be corrected. 
the inflation narrative is an interesting one. Like ten percent is is a, is a big number, especially if it want, if it's reported officially. Like we all know, there's you know shadow stats and all that. It's always higher. True inflation is much lower right now than the reported CPI number. So I'm curious, like, how do you get to ten percent? Like, if you can explain it to us in layman terms, like, how do you get to ten percent? What is driving prices or the CPI to ten percent, or the government to even report an official ten percent number? Remember, we got to nine point one. That was the high water mark this cycle. And that was the CPI, uh, uh, you know, and, and that measure grossly understates the rate at which prices are going up. So if the government officially admits in the CPI that prices went up 9%, they probably went up closer to 18%. I just think as a rule of thumb, just double whatever it is the government claims. And that's going to be a lot closer to the real number than, than the government number. Uh, so to act to get to 10 percent, we really only need 5 percent, right, officially. And then we're probably there. But if we got to 9 percent uh, last time, even using the CPI, we can go much, much higher next time because it's a much bigger problem uh, because they're going to print even more money. You know, it, it's they have to keep upping the size of the stimulus to keep the game, game going. You know, so and I, and I said that from the very beginning. In fact, when the when they stopped QE the third time, I said, well, when they do four QE four, it's going to be bigger than one, two and three combined. And in fact, it was, you know, when they restarted QE, they actually increased the balance sheet by more than the entirety of the first three rounds of quantitative easing. So the next round could be bigger than the last four. So, you know, we were, we're we got up to a, what, eight trillion dollar balance sheet and change right now. It's about seven trillion. But the next round of QE could take the balance sheet up to fifteen trillion. That's a, that's a lot of money, of course, and uh, <laughs> the, 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 it's always a question of timing as well. Because I'm just looking at the inflation chart here, the U.S. inflation chart. Official, re- I have to go by the official reported numbers here. Is two point five percent for August. Um, don't have a forecast for September yet here. Two point three percent consensus apparently. So it's coming down to two percent. Like it is trending that way. Like, is there any need for the Fed to change anything? Like right now? Like, are they actually doing the right well, thing? Are they behind the eight ball? Like, what are your thoughts? Like, it well, always the pendulum know that always it's swings. Really of course, trending down anymore because it's been hanging out around three percent for over a year, <laughs> and and so it hasn't really made much progress over the past year or so. And I think that you're more likely just kind of forming a base. And one of the reasons that the numbers came down was the year over year comparisons were easy because prices went up so much. But now you're going to have the opposite situation where prices have already come off their peaks. And so now the year over year numbers won't won't look as good. But also what really helped uh, bring down headline CPI was the strength of the dollar, which actually peaked out in 2022, but we had about a 15% rise or almost maybe close to a 20% rise in the dollar index uh, from, you know, from the trough to the peak. And that helped bring oil prices down, other commodity prices down, which really, you know, put some pressure on headline CPI. Well, now the dollar index has dropped about 10% from its peak. It's trending down. And so that's going to have the opposite effect on consumer prices and, you know, commodities like oil you're going to start to see upward pressure on those prices. And that's going to bleed into the headline CPI numbers. Meanwhile, you know, the core never went up as much as the headline, but it never came down as much as the headline. And the core CPI is even further away from 2% than the headline. You you brought up oil, and I want to touch on energy real quick, because it's a big factor here, of course. Um, uh, Gasoline prices down 10% uh, month over month, of course. Um, Given what we're seeing geopolitically, like, what's your oil price prediction? And uh, how how does that fit in? How big of a factor will it be moving forward? Yeah, well, oil had up until today in the last uh, month or so, oil was up uh, close to 20%, maybe 18% from its lows. But it's having a big drop today, almost $4 a barrel. But, you know, we're back below 74. But we got down to 65, like, you know, within the last month. Oil is cheap. In fact, if you look at oil in terms of gold, oil got down to like 40 uh, 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 barrels of oil for one ounce of gold. If you throw out, you know, a couple of months during COVID when it was a complete aberration where oil prices went negative, you know, but if, if you just don't count that, Oil has never been this cheap. You've never been able to buy 40 barrels with one ounce of gold. I mean, look back throughout time. So 
com consumers are getting a huge deal right now on oil. And that's why all the talk about, well, you know, we have inflation because oil. It's got nothing to do with oil. <laughs> oil is, you know, where we're catching a break. <laughs> we have all this, this inflation despite cheap oil. <laughs> yeah. um, but the fact that oil is this cheap means it's not going to stay down here. So it, it's, it's we're going to have another big uh, wave of rising oil prices. And of course, that's going to reflect in, in the CPI numbers. Perfect. No, I appreciate the oil, the excursion here. We, we're going to touch on oil, I think, in a second when we talk about the mining stocks and margin developments. I want, I want to talk uh, talk with you about that as well. But uh, I mentioned to you, I saw a headline just earlier, and I keep quoting Reuters as a news source I go to, and uh, don't discredit me in the comments for it. But uh, top news headline today is smaller U.S. trade deficit supports strong economic growth estimates for third quarter. And uh, we, we talked about deficit spending, and I'm really trying to figure out where is that growth coming from, Peter? He's like, yeah, maybe you can you know, help explain you know, it to me. That's just a bunch of spin. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the trade deficits are enormous. They've been, we've had record trade deficits earlier this year. The fact that they're slightly below all-time record highs, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Uh, the fact that we're running these massive trade deficits in and of itself is evidence of a weak economy. The fact that they're not quite as massive as they were a few months ago uh, doesn't change anything. I mean, one of the reasons that the trade deficits may finally be coming down is Americans are just so broke that they can't buy any more stuff. I mean, they're, they're maxed out their credit cards. Meanwhile, credit card interest rates just hit a new record high. They're still moving further above 21 percent. So the Fed rate cuts has brought down credit card rates. They, they keep going up. Haven't brought down mortgage rates. They've been inching higher. So Americans are still struggling with rising interest rates, even though the Fed has cut them. Uh, but no, I, th I think that the the huge trade deficits reflect the underlying weakness of of the U.S. economy. Yeah, it's interesting. Like you brought it up. Like I was just looking at a ten year chart and uh, the United States balance of trade here, Peter, and it's always been negative. The U.S. has always been a net importer of goods. Um, well, not in, in always. General. You know, but it for a long time. I mean, you know, during it, it switched in the 1980s. I think it was the latter part of the 1980s that we we stopped running surpluses and started running deficits. And, and that's why now, you know, instead of being the world's biggest creditor nation, which was true in the 1980s, we're now the world's biggest debtor because those persistent trade deficits have eroded away. Our, our our wealth and so we've gone from the world's biggest creditor to the world's biggest debtor and in fact we have so much debt that if you add up all the other debtor nations together and combine their debts you still don't get the u.s that that's how how bad it is Debt is an interesting topic we, we need to talk about because it, it, it segues perfectly to the U.S. dollar discussion that we touched on a couple of times already here in our conversation. But the strength of the U.S. dollar, I, I mentioned that the Dixie is at about 102.5. It's been trying to break down. Uh, the chart has been trying to break down uh, below 100, obviously, and you've been forecasting a dollar decline, a dollar crash here. Like, w w What's the trend and what's the role of the U.S. dollar in that overall situation, also in that it, as part of the debt overall? Yeah, we've been trending down. I mean, we almost got through 100. I think we got down about 100.2. And then we got a big pop the other week and we're back at 102 and a half ish. That was because we got some economic numbers like that jobs number we talked about, a few others uh, that were not as weak as expected or, you know, what some consider to be strong. And so that, you know, pushed back some of the rate cut bets. And, and uh, so that, that uh, got the dollar to balance, but the trend is down. The Fed is cutting rates. The economy is weakening. Uh, that narrative will be back on the front burner once we get some more uh, negative surprises on the economic front. Meanwhile, manufacturing numbers have been dismal the entire time. We continue to lose manufacturing jobs. All the manufacturing ISM PMI numbers are you know, solidly in contraction mode, and they've been there for a couple of years. So nothing has improved on the manufacturing front. Yeah, you know, we have more people tending bar and waiting tables. I mean, that was the biggest category of private sector jobs in the last jobs report, uh, you know, waiters and bartenders. Now, I mean, you can't build an economy on waiters and bartenders. I mean, the problem is some of these waiters and bartenders used to work in manufacturing 
<laughs> and now they're you know they're they're waiting tables. That's the only thing they can do. And a lot of these jobs, the reason we create so many jobs in restaurants and bars is because they're part time jobs, and that's just how they fit them into people's schedules. They work ten hours, five hours. They work some shifts. Some people work at night. A lot of these waiter and bartender jobs are people who are taking second and third jobs because that's the only way they could pay the rent, you know, or, you know, keep the lights going or, you know, put food on the table. Uh, moonlighting is at an all time record high. That's another statistic in the jobs report last week. The number of people working multiple jobs hit another record high. And, you know, that's not a sign of a strong economy. When people are forced to take multiple jobs to make ends meet, you know, that's not what people want. People want leisure. You know, they want to work less, not more, uh, but they have no choice because the economy is so weak and inflation is so strong that they have to work longer and longer hours just to eke out the, the same or even a diminished standard of living. We have U.S. elections coming up, and uh, you, you touch on an important point. People are just fed up. Like The economic situation is not great. People are taking three jobs. How, how will that be reflected in about four weeks' time when people go to the polls? Well, I mean, ironically enough, even Kamala Harris is trying to position herself as like a change candidate. <laughs> like <laughs> things are going to be really different once she's president. Uh, but you would think that most of the discouraged, uh, disgruntled voter uh, who is pissed about his financial circumstances, you would think that, you know, you know, a lot of those would break Trump's way because he seems like uh, a, a bigger change from the current Biden administration than, than, than electing his vice president. So you would think that this would benefit Trump. I mean, normally when times are bad and it's a pocketbook election, which they usually are, you know, it's the economy, stupid, and people vote their, their, their pocketbooks. Uh, it's normally, well, let's throw the bums out, right? Whoever's in charge when times are bad, let's get rid of them and let's bring in some somebody else and give them a chance, you know? And so that should benefit Trump because, you know, he's on the outside right now, especially when he can point to what the economy was like when he was president. And again, you know, it wasn't nearly as strong as he claims. He claims it was the greatest economy ever. It wasn't. But in comparison to where it is now, most people were better off back then. And they, they know that, you know, they're deeper in debt now. And they see how much everything costs. Their grocery bills are a lot higher. Their health insurance, their taxes, you know, uh, a lot of things have gone up. And even though oil prices have come down, gas prices are still quite a bit higher because you have a lot of other costs that, 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 are, that are added into those gas prices, you know, in addition to just what the oil costs. How do you see the election affecting the economy? Like, if you were to make a prediction, like, what, what come, uh, let's say, March 15th, what, what, is it, what is it going to look like? Well, you know, the things are going to get worse regardless of the outcome of this election. Inflation is going to be a bigger problem after the election than it was before. Uh, none of the candidates, um, you know, are going to likely do anything in the short run to to alter that i mean i think that on the margin trump is 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 better for the economy than than harris i mean harris wants more regulation and so you know that's obviously a negative uh trump is more likely to repeal uh certain regulations um and you know that that's a positive and some of the tax proposals particularly you know unrealized taxing unrealized capital gains as if it were income I don't know that that would actually get passed, but if, you know, obviously there's always a chance. There's no chance if Trump is president. So that's that's a negative. But, you know, she does want to raise taxes on corporations and uh, higher income individuals. Trump wants to raise taxes uh, on everybody through tariffs. I think that the tariffs uh, are are a better way for the government to raise revenue than higher income taxes. The higher income taxes are definitely uh, anti-growth. Uh, the tariffs are more pro-growth. Uh, it's just disingenuous for Trump to say that the Chinese are going to pay them or the Mexicans. No, Americans are going to pay those tariffs. 
Uh, but those tariffs will result in a somewhat smaller deficit than we would have without the tariffs. So, you, you know, we still have to pay for the government spending and paying for it with tariffs is better than paying for it uh, with more inflation or higher income taxes or wherever else government is going to fund. But the one thing that we know that neither candidate is going to do is make any meaningful cuts to government spending. Uh, nobody is proposing that. Um, Trump is proposing increasing government spending. Um, the only, he is talking about cutting waste, fraud and abuse and putting Elon Musk in charge of that. Uh, but, you know, you know, they've been talking about cutting waste, fraud and abuse for decades. It's, so that, that that's everybody's willing to do that. Right. But one person's waste, fraud and abuse uh, is some valuable money to whoever gets it. <laughs> so and there's usually a big constituency behind every you know, government program, the people who benefit from it uh, make a big noise if you threaten to take away that benefit, even though collectively the country is worse off because of all these programs. The people who benefit uh, have more to lose uh, when the programs are taken away than any other individual has to gain. I mean, let's say you have 300 million people that you know lose $10 a year each because of some program, well, I mean, they're not going to give you a lot of money for your campaign to save that $10. I mean, it, they, they barely notice it. Uh, but the guy who loses $100 million, if you take that subsidy away, he, he, he can write the big checks you know, to preserve that. But the problem is every one of these programs, you know, if, if it's hitting somebody $10, uh, and, and then you do it a thousand times, whatever. I mean, it, it eventually adds up to a lot of money, but it's not in any one uh, program except, you know, the big ones, Social Security, Medicare, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, that's that. Those are big, but nobody has the guts to even think about going after those. Yeah, that's uh, that's are, very I mean, sensitive. <laughs> you have lobbyist groups like the, you know, the American Association of Retirement People, right? You have all these people you know, tens of millions, maybe 100 million Americans who are collecting or about to collect Social Security, Medicare. So that's a big special interest group, right? Nobody wants to piss those guys off. That's why even Donald Trump, what is he promising? Not only is he not going to cut Social Security, he's going to eliminate the taxes on the benefits, <laughs> which, you know, is like increasing Social Security at a time when it's already broke because those taxes help reduce the deficit, Social Security right now, and this is something that just started under Biden, but we were you know, heading in this direction. But Social Security actually pays out every year more than it collects by over $100 billion. And that's with the Social Security taxes you know, offsetting the loss. So if, if we eliminate the taxes, then that $100 billion a year loss is going to be much bigger. And of course, it's, it's scheduled to get much bigger every year anyway. Because every year more people retire and they stop paying Social Security taxes and they start collecting and we don't have enough new people entering the labor force to make up for the loss. No, it's true words, Peter. Absolutely agree there. Um, I, have, I have a hypothetical question for you. I was just uh, curious what your thoughts are or what your thought is. If I were to come to you or if anybody were to come to you tomorrow and say, Peter, you're going to be the next U.S. president, would you say yes or no? Well, I mean, if, if they would if, uh, just make me president, would it's I like, accept would, the is, job? It sounds I mean, like an I, extremely I I unthankful to, job right now, right? It's like a very unthankful to, job. I, I would have to take the job if it was offered to me, but not, that's not the way our political system works. So, no, no, of course not. But it's like it's, it sounds like it's you're catching a falling knife. Like you, regardless of who's you know, president, be, like look, I would be willing to to take the job, assuming the country was willing to. Uh, offer to me. <laughs> no, it's, it's hypothetical. It's more it's like the, the proposition is that it's you're catching a falling knife, and uh, at least for the first two to three years, that pr the city, the president will yeah, be in a no-win scenario. Is, the problem is, in order to get elected, you have to really lie to the public to get elected. And then once you've told so many lies in order to get elected, I mean, how do you tell the truth and say, <laughs> look, everything I said to get elected was a lie? It's like it's kind of <laughs> hard to do that. On the other hand, if you if you campaign telling the truth it's going to be very difficult to get elected. See, that's the problem with me, too. I have a big record uh, of opposing all kinds of sacred cows, you know, in government. And so I can't, you know, I can't just, all, I can't be Camilla Harris and be like, 
you know, flip flop on everything that I've believed in <laughs> for the past you know, 20, 30 years publicly and say you know, the opposite because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not piss people off and get their votes. <laughs> At, at least you're not um, speaking a German accent to me right now, so I appreciate that. Yeah, but yeah. but you know, I know what needs to be done to uh, fix the problems. I mean, they are fixable, but you know, they're not fixable the way Donald Trump pretends they are. You know, you hear Trump speak at a rally, and he says, "Well, all you have to do is elect me, and it's going to be a boom like we've never seen before." The economy is going to boom. You're going to be so rich. It, you know, it's going to amaze you. Uh, everybody's going to make so much money. It's going to be the greatest thing in the history of the world. And, you know, just vote for Trump. And just just all I have to do is assume office. And this is going to happen. Right? And, you know, my tax cuts and drill, baby drill or whatever he's talking about. But none of this is true. And, of course, all of this, you know, over promising is going to be difficult when he under delivers because we're not going to have an economic boom. We're far more likely to have an economic bust. Now, that doesn't mean we wouldn't have had the bust under Harris. But if you campaign and you say, if you elect me, everything's going to be great. And then it's not great. It's almost like, well, it's your fault then or something. It's, it's hard. It's much better to prepare people in advance. Look, things are going to get worse, even if you vote for me. Right now, you know, again, yeah, it's hard to get elected, <laughs> you know, telling the truth that things can only get better if they get worse first. But Trump is promising immediate results, you know, positive, no pain, just gain. Right. <laughs> and so nobody is prepared for what's actually going to happen. So that that is a problem. But the question is, can you get elected, you know, promising short term pain for long term gain? Yeah, I'm going to fix the problems. But in doing that, you know, Things are going to get worse before they get better. We have to spend less. We have to save more. And when we do that, you know, some, you know that there's some short term problems. You know, it's like, you know, hey, you know, you're overweight and I know how I can get you back in shape, but it means you're going to have to go on a diet and you're going to have to exercise. And Sounds awful. <laughs> that, 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 that is a problem for somebody who just, you know, eats a lot of, you know, junk food and doesn't exercise, you know, having to go to the gym and having to watch what they eat. That's the equivalent of austerity. I got to do without things that I like. I'm not going to have as much fun because I can't just eat whatever the hell I want. And I, you know, I got to, you know, I got to get up extra early in the morning and I got to go to the gym and I got to run. I got to do all this exercise. Um, but but that will at least work. <laughs> you know, if somebody <laughs> does that, they will lose weight. I mean, Donald Trump is promising. I know you're fat and out of shape, but just vote for me. And I'm, I got a magic cream for you. <laughs> just swallow it. You'll be in great shape. And, you know, you won't have to diet. You could, in fact, you could even eat more. <laughs> and you're well, on that topic, is like just maybe as a quick follow up, since we're on that topic, Argentina. And uh, yeah. is, is the U.S. not hurting enough to go the route of Argentina, maybe? And uh, Yeah, well, think about how long it took for Argentina to, yeah. to take a shot at Malay. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, I mean, we're not, no, we're not there. We're not Argentina yet. Now, the good news is we're going to become Argentina. So maybe, <laughs> maybe we will at some point have enough pain that we'll be willing to try something different. But right now, we still want politicians promising to make the pain go away or to have a painless solution. They had been making those empty promises in Argentina for so long that the public wasn't swallowing it anymore. And things had gotten so bad, they're like, okay, I mean, we, we can't handle any more government solutions to these government problems. Let's try a different approach. And of course, Malay's approach is government is the problem. Let's get rid of it. And he just cuts things and eliminates government spending. You know, the, the, the natural response to a problem in government is more government. I mean, that's what Harris is promising. More government spending. Oh, there's problems for housing. Well, let's the government give everybody $25,000 to buy a house. Oh, there's problems with small businesses. Let's give all people $50,000, you know, dollars. Uh, credits, tax deductions, whatever to bought to, to start their business or, oh, it's hard. It's expensive to raise a family. Let's give everybody seven thousand dollars for every kid. Hmm. You know, I mean, this is just more government. Well, I mean, what is, you know, <laughs> it's just bigger <laughs> deficits, more inflation. 
That's not going to help. No. You know, what we need is to eliminate a lot of government. But again, even Donald Trump, he talks in the abstract about making government efficient. But government can never be efficient. I mean, by definition, you're not going to get an efficient government. That's why government needs to be small. Whatever you have government do, they're going to do it inefficiently. It's not the private sector. That's why you want most of the stuff to be done in the private sector, because that's where you get efficiencies. Uh, but what we need is just to cut government, not make it more efficient, just eliminate a lot of the, the functions that, that it's doing. And these are things that constitutionally it has no business doing in the first place. Like, look right now at all the problems with FEMA, right? We had this huge hurricane. Now we have another hurricane coming and FEMA's out of money and everybody is upset. But why do we even have FEMA? There's nothing in the Constitution that says the government is supposed to um, provide relief for natural disasters wherever they occur. This is not a, a, a federal function. This should all be done locally by local and state governments and by individuals on their own. And initially, you know, you go back to the Glover, Grover Cleveland days when they, you know, they tried to pass some kind of bailout. There was a, uh, a drought in Texas, I think, and uh, there was like a $10,000 appropriation to help these drought stricken farmers. And Grover Cleveland vetoed it. And he said, I can put my finger on no section of the Constitution that authorizes this expenditure. <laughs> um, and he said, look, if you want to give money of your own, donate it. And he did. He wrote a check. I forget how much. And he sent money. And they ended up raising a lot more money than the $10,000 government appropriation. But the point was, it was, you know, this is not up to the federal government. But what's happened over the years, you know, especially since the j days of, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and then, you know, the John Lyndon Johnson and all that great society, you know, war and poverty nonsense. The government now, every emergency, every disaster, no matter where it is, the government is there throwing down huge amounts of money. And as a result of this, locally, we, nobody is prepared. Everybody is now conditioned to believe that the government, the federal government is going to step up and, and, and provide the relief. And so it's a huge moral hazard. And, and so on the local levels, we're not prepared. But it's much better for North Carolina to take care of its own problems as opposed to Washington, D.C. taking care of its problems. And California takes care of its problems instead of outsourcing it to Washington, D.C. You have Washington, D.C. trying to take care of wildfires in California, hurricanes, you know, in, in, in the Carolinas, I mean, what, or, you know, whatever happens, you know, but it's there's so much corruption in there at the federal level. There's so much, you know, graft, very inefficient way to do it. Uh, and the government, by throwing money at people, you know, people don't have as enough private insurance. Uh, they, they, you know, they, I don't want insurance. So I'm just going to get government bailout money. You know, the, the governments, the state governments don't have their own emergency funds because they figure, well, I'm going to, you know, who can, why do I have to save? We have a disaster. Washington, D.C. is going to come in and, you know, so there's a moral hazard. Nobody wants to save for their own, you know, rainy day fund. Meanwhile, the government doesn't have any money. The government doesn't actually have money to give Florida. Uh, they're going to have to borrow it from China or the Fed's going to have to print it. And right? so it, it's not like the federal government even has any money, but it has the printing press. Uh, but, you know, this is the problem as that the real disaster is the moral hazard that FEMA creates not the natural disasters uh, that it is, you know, has been established to deal with, but the, it's a man-made disaster that's even bigger. No, no very, appreciate your thoughts there, Peter. And uh, FEMA's uh, Jimmy Carter, 1978. So I just looked it up real quick as well. It was interesting. Um, well, that's when uh, FEMA started? Yeah, uh, by yeah, President Jimmy Carter Reorganization Plan number three. He, just, he started the Department of Energy uh, also, which, you know, yeah, that was in response to the, uh, you know, the oil crisis, well, which, you know, was a result of the Fed anyway. But the Department of Energy is a complete waste, doesn't produce one drop of oil. <laughs> but I mean, we could get rid of that. And the Department of, of, of Education wasn't started that much early. I was, I think, started in the 60s. <laughs> no, interesting you know, stuff I mean, on the U.S. We, government. How do, we, Peter, how, I, how do we get to the 1960s without a Department of Education and a Department of of energy. I mean, we had education, we had energy, but we just didn't have these government agencies that were 
in charge of it. And in fact, if you look at the quality of our public schools today compared to the quality before the government created the education department, it's much lower. The government has screwed up our public school system. We were much better off before the federal government got involved. Oh, hundred percent. Like usually, like when it's privately run, usually more efficient and uh, better organized. But Peter, I got two more big topics I quickly want to yeah. tackle with you because I think one topic is going to lead to the other. And th the first one is, and we got to take you up uh, on the on the doom and gloom scale. We got to take it up one notch because we we need. I, I want to know from you, like how is this all playing out? What we discussed on the economic side, like what, what's your forecast? A lot of it we, we discussed was short term. Like what what is it going to look like in five years from now? How is this all playing out? Well, you know, it all depends on when the markets wake up to the reality that inflation is not going down to 2%. It's going to be much higher indefinitely. And that, you know, real interest rates are going to be negative indefinitely. And, and then when that happens, you know, credibility, the Fed's credibility will be gone. You know, we're not going to have these, you know, 2% break evens, like, like I mentioned earlier, uh, our creditors are going to demand a much higher uh, premium for uh, inflation and for the credit risk of the United States. And we can't afford it. And so it's just going to lead to even more money printing and higher inflation. And then we get in a, you know, perpetual kind of death spiral where the uh, Bonds keep falling, rates keep rising, prices keep rising, the government keeps printing to buy more bonds, to keep rates from rising, which pushes prices higher, which puts more upward pressure on interest rates, which causes bigger deficits and more money printing. And it's just an endless cycle of currency debasement uh, until it you know, really runs out of control. And then you get a potential hyperinflation scenario. Uh, you know, MICE is called you know, the crack up boom. Um, but you know, this is how, uh, fiat currencies end. And, uh, that's the direction that, that we're headed. Um, and you know, we're in very dangerous, dangerous political waters because, you know, there is a big tendency to blame capitalism for stuff that goes wrong, even though it's government intervention in capitalism. That is the problem, not mm -hmm. capitalism itself. Capitalism is always the solution to government created problems, but the governments, you know, they never accept responsibility for their problems. They, they blame capitalism and it, you know, the public in many cases buys into that. They blame the greedy businessmen and the corporations and the speculators and, you know, whoever it is that the government vilifies. Um, and, and so they're going to try to do that obviously with this next crisis, but it's always hard to know exactly how, it's going to play out as far as the timetable, because, you know, we're already way beyond when it should have happened. I mean, it's, you know, it's ridiculous that this is almost 2025 and we have a $36 trillion national debt uh, that we're spending over a trillion dollars a year on interest payments on that debt. The Fed's got a $7 trillion balance sheet, you know, and we haven't already had a crisis. I mean, you would ex imagine uh, with, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, deficits this large and the imbalances this great that something would have already cracked. <laughs> uh, so we're literally living on borrowed time. Uh, and so there's no way to know, you know, when the music stops. I think it's all the artificial money and the deficits that's propping up the economy. Like we talked about it earlier, the growth, the the suspicious growth numbers that uh, we, we've referenced here earlier. Um, Peter, one thing we haven't covered yet is commodities and, and gold in particular. Um, we, we need to talk about the gold price, Peter. I know your prediction is five to ten thousand dollars. We're well on our way there. Um, is it, it the question though? Is is it moving faster than is the gold price maybe moving faster than you would have thought, or is that uh, on in uh, on track and pace uh, that w what you've expected? No, I mean, it, it's still moving slower because I, I would have assumed years ago that we would already be quite a bit higher than than 26,000 or 2,600 on the price of gold. But, you know, if you look at it so far this century, um, gold started the century in January of 2001. Gold was under 300. And, and so it's now over 2,600. So it's gone up over eightfold. Uh, the Dow Jones has gone up about fourfold. 
a little bit more. It was about a little over 10,000. Now it's a little over 40,000. So, you know, about a, a four, four, uh, a 10 of, uh, a four X increase, um, in the, in the Dow versus, uh, an eight X in gold, which means priced in gold, the Dow is actually, you know, about half of what it was 20 years ago, which really puts in perspective what's going on. That it's not that the Dow is more valuable. It's that, uh, the dollar is less valuable. So you need four times as many dollars to buy the Dow, but you need eight times as many to buy an ounce of gold. Um, but I still think gold is cheap historically. I think it's a, the level now is about 16 to one or so, 16 ounces of gold to buy the Dow. Um, you know, I think, you know, you know, it's going much lower. I mean, certainly below 10, probably below five. You know, whether it gets to one to one, it's a tough call, you know, maybe two to one, uh, you know, but even two to one, you know, where would that be? Well, gold would have to be 20,000 if the Dow is 40,000. But, you know, th we've been there. We've been at one to one almost twice in 1932 and even 1980. 1980, it was $800 for an ounce of gold and $800 for the Dow. <laughs> so they were about one to one or they're approximately. Um, now, that represented a very cheap Dow and very expensive gold at that point in time, but it happened, right? So if it happens again, right, it doesn't mean that, you know, gold should be that expensive or that the Dow should be that cheap, but it can happen. But right now, the price is, is still uh, 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 too high for the Dow relative to gold. So I forget what the long-term average is, um, but it's lower than it is right now. So gold is cheap, you know, relative to the stock market. And 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 so and that's going to change because the, the, the stock market should not be as uh, richly valued as it is, given the enormity of the problems that are not being priced in. But that said, right, if we have hyperinflation or, or even extremely high double digit inflation, then you would expect the Dow to price that in, but not in terms of gold. So I can be very bearish on the Dow and think that it's overpriced or overvalued, but that doesn't mean I don't think the price can go up in terms of dollars. It absolutely could go up. I mean, the Dow can go to 100,000, but if gold goes to 50,000 at the same time, the Dow has crashed because now we're down to two to one from 16 to one. So you have to look at both prices to know what the Dow is really doing because you got to separate out the dollar because you know the dollar is lost a lot of value when when the country started in 1789 uh it, you needed 20 dollars to buy an ounce of gold and even as late as 1933 before roosevelt devalued you could still get an ounce of gold for 20 dollars. that's like 150 years and the dollar didn't lose any value but but starting in 1971 because Gold was still $35 an ounce until, you know, 1970. But once Nixon took us off the gold standard, now you don't need 30. You can't buy an ounce of gold with $35. You need $2,600 to buy that ounce of gold. Now, what has changed since 1970? The, the gold hasn't changed. Gold is exactly the same, right? They haven't improved gold. Right? Gold is not like a car or a, a telephone, something that's gotten better, right, over time because we have better ways of making it. Gold has not changed. It's exactly the way it was 5,000 years ago when they were using gold. So gold has stayed exactly the same. What's changed is the value of the dollar. You used to be able to buy an ounce of gold for $20. Now you need $2,600 to buy the same ounce. So if gold can go from $20 to 2600 it can go from 2,600 to 26,000 or 260,000. The only question is how much longer is it gonna to take to get to those prices? But I think the rate at which the dollar is going to depreciate is going to accelerate in the years ahead. So I think the dollar is going to start losing value faster, let's say over the next 10 years than it has over the prior 10 or 20 years. So I think you're gonna see that reflected in an even higher gold price. But again, it's not gold going up, it's the dollar going down and the euro going down and the pound going down and the yen going down. You know, all these currencies are being debased. It's not just the dollar. 
Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's what we're seeing in the, in the charts as it is being reflected right now. Peter, like I, I wanted to ask you about mining stocks, but uh, I don't know. We, we were sort of running at the uh, towards the end of our time slot here. Um, it, it's 50 minutes already, but to maybe just really your two cents on the mining stocks. Like wh- when 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 does the rally really start? Yes, some of the stocks are up 30 percent. I get it. The GDX is up 30 percent, but it doesn't feel yeah, like we're anywhere no- near where we should be. Yeah, the mining stocks have barely outperformed gold year to date. And given how cheap they were, and if you recall, too, at the early in the year, in fact, I don't know if we talked about it on the last podcast, if it was before or after or your last show, but February or March of this year, we had major downgrades of Barrick Gold, Newmont Mining. Both of those stocks were hitting multi-year lows. They didn't hit just they didn't just hit 52 week lows. They hit multi-year lows earlier this year. So the mining stocks were very cheap. And then gold had this huge rally. Uh, and the mining stocks you know, didn't give you the type of um, returns, the type of leverage that you would have expected, given how cheap they were before we had this big rally. And that's because when gold was at 2000, everybody assumed that that was the top and that it was just going to go down. And that was the basis by which uh, they downgraded Newmont and Barrick as they, the analysts didn't see any upside in gold. They thought gold had topped out. Little did they know this was going to be the best year since 1979 for the price of gold. And, you know, if you watch these stocks, and I watch them pretty closely, investors are very skittish. There's very little conviction because at the first sign of trouble, you see a move down in gold and they just ki- dump these gold mining stocks. They'll get crushed. And then it takes several days rallies for them to come back, you know, to where they were. You know, so gold, gold can make a new high and and the gold stocks, you know, won't. And then it makes two or three new highs in a row. And then the gold stocks will finally catch up and make a new high. Then you get a small correction. Gold drops maybe 30, 40, 50 bucks and gold stocks lose almost everything they gain. And so now even when gold makes another new high, the gold stocks are still five percent below the previous new high because they haven't even come close to recovering what they just lost. And and it looks like, too, like the gold mining stocks just trade as a proxy for the gold price that day. (laughs) People are still not looking at them as actual businesses and thinking about how much uh, their 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 businesses have improved with the price of gold. You know, when you got record low oil prices for gold miners, that's good for their profits. I think we're going to start to see some uh, big beats. Uh, in uh, the mining companies. Meanwhile, the big mining stocks, uh, Barrick, Newmont, are trading at discounts to the S&P when they historically trade at premiums. Uh, They're trading at very cheap price to book. I mean, these companies are making a lot of money. Uh, They're poised to increase their dividends, increase stock buybacks, and nobody owns them. You know, in fact, if you look at uh, the big uh, gold mining ETFs like the GDX, GDXJ, They've had net outflows this year. Investors have been selling gold stocks, uh, just like they've been selling physical gold. The GLD, the biggest gold ETF, has had net outflows this year. Um, so, you know, the public is not involved at all in this rally, which goes to show you how much bigger the rally is going to be when they finally get involved. And not just the mom and pop retailers. It's going to be, you know, the institutions, the big boys are going to are going to come. I mean, right now it's foreign central banks, but they're going to step it up. You know, they they, they, they have a lot more gold to buy. They have barely uh, scratched the surface. You know, look now, uh, Poland just announced that they've got more gold now than the UK. Um, but this is a race. I mean, these central banks need to replace their dollars with gold because they can read the writing on the wall. Right. They, they wrote it. You know, they know the dollar's days as the reserve currency are numbered and they have to prepare for a, a post uh, dollar world. And, and that, that's a world where gold plays a much more important role as a, a monetary reserve. And so that's why these central banks are buying and they've got a lot more fiat uh, to convert to gold, particularly uh, U.S. dollars. So I think this is a great opportunity. I mean, people should be buying the physical metal. Uh, you know, gold and silver are still very cheap. Silver is barely above $30 an ounce. You know, it was $50 in 1980. It's not that many commodities that you could buy, you know, for 40% off their 1980 price. Uh, so silver is one of them. So people should be buying it. 
while they can, you know, contact my company at Shift Gold. You know, buy it today. Go on shiftgold.com. Uh, you can actually just uh, fill up your shopping cart with silver coins and bars, throw some gold in there, and check out. <laughs> and you can uh, <laughs> exchange uh, some you can, paper fiat currency for you, some real currency. You know, if you're looking for, you know, the ten bagger or a bigger return, um, you know, the gold mining stocks. I think for a risk taker. Um, that's where I think the risk reward is by far the greatest. I don't see tremendous downside in these stocks. I mean, there is, especially if you're diversified, you have a portfolio, there's downside, but nowhere near the upside. The upside is just, you know, stratospheric uh, compared to the downside. So that's what you're looking for from a speculative investment is you want to make sure that if you bet right, you really, really hit it big. Uh, oh, and I, I think that's the case. So, you know, you could buy the stocks yourself or again, to play it safer, get diversified mm -hmm. and get into either one of our managed accounts our separately managed accounts at your Pacific Asset Management or anybody can buy my gold fund, EPIGX, no, EPGIX. Yeah, EPGIX is the no load symbol. EPGIX, you can buy it, uh, any discount brokerage firm. Uh, and Adrian Day is a manager on the fund as well. And I think we've got a great portfolio, uh, a lot of smaller stocks, a lot of you know warrants that we got from doing private deals that aren't even being priced. Uh, so I think we're really poised to have some significant uh, performance, you know, in in the years ahead in that gold fund. So it's a good time to uh, to get invested. Fantastic, Peter. I love that we managed to end on a positive note here. So because we talked a lot <laughs> yeah, of doom and gloom, well, it's great. It to all fun. We only have about two hundred fifty million dollars in the gold fund. So as far yeah. as a mutual fund, I mean, that's not a big fund. I mean, I've, I think eventually it's going to have billions of dollars in it. <laughs> but yeah, not, like, not seriously, only because like, more people are going to invest in it, right? But because the, the, the NAV is going to rise because all the mining stocks are going to go up. Yeah. You know, And a lot of people who are not even looking at mining stocks, once their returns are so good looking backward, it's going to attract a lot of money. But right now... Uh, that money is going, you know, to NVIDIA or, you know, the AI trade and stuff like that. And so nobody is paying attention to the gold mining stocks. Give it six weeks. We'll see the Q3 numbers come out. And I'm curious what they're going to look like. Newmont right now is barely I, I tracking think, gold. So. I definitely think Kamala Harris win is is more bullish for gold than, than Trump. But I think, you know, it's bullish either way. Absolutely. Like, I think the trend is clear. Um, like, yeah. I can't get away from it on this channel. I think that the trend is absolutely clear where things are headed. There's no debate about it. So, Peter, you've been extremely generous with your time. I tremendously appreciate it. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on. Just maybe to summarize it, where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? Because you have a fantastic YouTube channel as well. Yeah, well, my YouTube channel is The Shift Report, and we put up a lot of content, uh, especially my podcast, The Peter Shift Show, which uh, I do my own, you know, at least one a week sometimes more at shiftradio.com and on my YouTube channel, we do it live. So people should, you know, go to my YouTube channel and subscribe. So you get the notifications of, you know, when something's coming up um, and listen to the podcast, but also follow me on social media. I do a lot uh, on X. I've got over a million followers now. So that's a reason to, you know, post things because I know people are paying attention on, uh, on X. And so, you know, follow me, get your friends to do that. I'm Definitely also do. on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. I mean, not as many followers there, but, you know, still a decent amount. And we put content up on all those different platforms. And I have a new business now, Shift Sovereign. Uh, we come out, we have a, a, a newsletter that comes out usually maybe three times a week, free newsletter. Um, it's a great read. We put a lot of good information in there. And we also have some premium products that you can learn about on the website, but definitely at least start trying the free newsletter. And you just got to go to shiftsovereign.com and just input your information and you'll start getting the emails from us uh, delivered into your inbox. That's shiftsovereign.com. Fantastic. We'll make sure to link to all of it down below, of course, here yeah, uh, below great. the video. So really, again, Peter, really appreciate your time. It's always great to see you. Thanks so much for making the effort coming on. And uh, it's great to catch up with you and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. You heard Peter Schiff. I think we're only at the beginning of a gold stock, but also gold rally here as well. Um, the gold stocks are still lagging behind historical performances versus the gold price. I just looked it up. Gold is up 27%. Newmont is up 28%. If you feel that is right, then uh, 
I can't help you. I'm sorry. Historical averages are three to one. I think we've just seen the proof of or the, the case study and the proof of concept that mining stocks will perform and will outperform. And uh, give it six weeks. We'll see the Q3 numbers come out. And uh, as Peter suggested, I think we'll see a lot of earnings beats. We'll see a lot of free cash flow come out. Really curious your thoughts of, uh, of our discussion down below. Leave any comment down below. It helps us out tremendously. Increase our reach. And of course, if you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially.